Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Octa Developer Stream. I'm Brian Demers, and with me is Micah Silverman and Heather Downing. Hello. Hey. hey. So we're, today we're going to talk about hooks and webhooks and all that fun stuff, right? Yes, and why we even would want to play with them in the first place. And again, uh, if you're following us on Twitter, I'm at Coraline. Go ahead, Micah. What is your Twitter name? A fit nerd. Are you a Don't fit nerd? Don't let all this fool you. I am. <laughs> and I am Brian Demers. Nice. Nice. All right. So, Micah. When I first came to Okta a few years ago, I remember we had a conversation about the cool things that you can do with automation and some like the different logs that Okta will give you as a developer. And I remember meeting you at Octane and we were talking about this cool way that you kind of folded in Okta hooks into like one of our uh, games to win a t-shirt, right? Can you start off with what the heck I'm talking about in a much better way? <laughs> yeah, so awesome, awesome intro. And it's a great place to start with Okta branding versus the rest of the world. So hooks are web hooks. There's no difference. And we didn't invent it. We do something awesome with web hooks, I think. But uh, we decided to call them hooks because it's catchy and it's uh, one syllable and it distinguishes us, but they're webhooks. And webhooks have been around for a while and just, you know, top level, basic, generally speaking, a webhook, it just allows another service to call out to some endpoint that you've defined and do some functionality and respond to that service. So it's a way to extend an existing service in new and unique ways, maybe mash up some APIs in ways they were never intended to be and uh, do some pretty cool stuff. And uh, as much as I love Okta, I thought I'd start out with like a super simple example uh, from Heroku because Heroku makes it really easy to uh, create add-ons. And if you're not familiar with Heroku, Heroku is, a, is an app hosting platform and they have this giant library of add-ons and anybody can go and create a Heroku add-on and Heroku calls them add-ons, but the mechanism behind the scenes are webhooks. So if you've ever deployed an app to Heroku that had a requirement uh, or, or a, um, a dependency on Postgres, you go to the Heroku add-on uh, uh, bazaar and you just add in Postgres. Behind the scenes, Heroku is making a request to some other service to go and provision Postgres. So I thought I'd start there because um, I wrote the uh, the Okta Heroku add-on, and I got um, I got very familiar with Heroku's whole uh, whole system of doing that. So I'm going to share my screen. I'll make everything big here, but and this isn't kind of the main event. This is where I just defined this very simple add-on called Okta Hero. Ku test. Uh, fun fact: you can't have the word Heroku in your add-on. So, of course, I I said challenge accepted, and so now it's Heroku. <laughs> but really, what's happening here is um, I have this uh, definition in a manifest file that tells Heroku where to call when I go to add this add-on to an app. So I have this app created. It's actually completely empty. There's no code deployed at all. But I'm saying, you know what? I'd like to provision this add-on called Okta Heroku Test for this app. And let me just make sure I have breakpoints set here. This is about as simple a, um, a Java app a uh, spring app as you can get, it's going to receive this Heroku provision request. And all I'm doing here is writing out to uh, pretty printing that JSON request. But I've pre-configured um, Heroku to, to reach out to my service. Now, I'm sitting on my home Wi-Fi network behind my 
uh, router and firewall. So how is Heroku going to reach my little locally running app here? Well, there's this awesome service that you may or may not be familiar with called Ngrok. Ngrok drills holes into your local environment so that you can test services from uh, the outside in. So I could give this URL to somebody and say, hey, test out this great program I wrote, and it's a publicly routable uh, domain that you get out of it. And uh, this is what allows us, so I've, I've configured Heroku to hit this endpoint, and so now I can test out this service without having to deploy it or set it up anywhere or anything like that. So when I go Heroku add-ons create, Heroku is going to reach out and, uh, and hit this endpoint, and I'll just set a breakpoint here so that we can see that it's actually doing that. So here we are, we're at my breakpoint. I'm just gonna let it go. And if we look at the console output, this is the request that Heroku sent in. So if we wanna talk about like what, are, what makes a webhook a webhook, it's a service that you run that another service can call and can kind of ingest these uh, RESTful requests. So it sends in things like the name, this is a name that Heroku allocated. It's got a unique UUID that it may need to use later. Importantly, it's got this callback URL because if you're provisioning a service like Okta, it may take, it may take more than two seconds. And so this way, the provisioning can be completely async. And when it's done, the add-on can use this unique callback to tell Heroku that the provisioning is done and make it available to your app. And that's exactly kind of the mode that I operated in here. And so our output is, it says it's being created in the app, in the background. The app will restart when it's complete. We can check its progress. Now this is Heroku's system to show me the progress. It just says that it's creating. And in fact, it's going to say it's creating forever because I never created the code to, to tell it that it was done. And even if I go to the Heroku interface here. If you notice over here, it shows that I've added this add-on to this app. And over here, you get the three, you know, like in progress dots. And it's going to stay that way indefinitely, actually for up to 12 hours. So Heroku will wait 12 hours before it finally gives up and says provisioning failed. The important bit here is that Heroku called my service. That's a webhook. Um, I can go ahead and uh, delete it. And when I delete it, if I can find the right one, uh, destroy, so add-ons destroy, I should have an endpoint that handles that deletion because maybe I need to delete something from my database. So Heroku attempted to reach out to my service again, attempted to make a webhook, it sent this delete request to this endpoint, and it just resulted in a 404 because I didn't implement that. But as far as Heroku is concerned, it's done its job, and it's no longer um, it's no longer associated with this app. So now I don't have any any add-ons. So Heroku is a great example of uh, a, a webhook in general. Um, you know, just kind of like the general mode of operation of webhooks, how they work. Um, um, and, and, you know, hopefully that gives kind of an overview of like, what is a webhook? What makes something a webhook? It's a service that you're running that, uh, that some other service is reaching out to, sending in a RESTful request, and you give a response that is something that it expects. And they, you know, all the services that support webhooks will have documentation and parameters around is it is it synchronous or asynchronous how long can you wait to respond um you know how to handle edge cases and all that good stuff yeah i actually so I thought that'd be a good place this. to start i ran into this a little bit when i was working on uh, some of the voice work uh so both google and uh alexa tend to want to be configured with hooks that way so I would say that um, it's interesting to try and debug, right? If you don't think about the process, um, 
with whether or not it's synchronous. Like that's it. You can definitely run into some debug problems. Um, so what did Okta do that I should care? And we lost Heather. Like, what should I care about? Yeah, so you froze up for a second, but yeah, I, but I think I got the the question. Like, what did Okta do that that we should care about? Um, great questions. One thing I do want to kind of you know give a shout out for Ngrok because you mentioned debugging. Just in general, um, let me share my screen again because Ngrok has this um, Ngrok has this great interface to. Um, be able to monitor the different kinds of requests that are coming by and and it gives you all kinds of detailed uh information if you, i know i know it's this way in spring boot but every like every three months or so i have to remember like how do i do verbose output of incoming http requests and then i do like a half hour of research and i remember what you know xml voodoo i have to do to get all that log output um, maybe it's that way in other frameworks. I don't know. But if you're using Ngrok and it's sitting in between, you can actually see all the the request, uh, the the body of the request, the headers that it's sent over. You can see the auth the the basic authorization that that uh, Heroku sent to my app. And so I had to configure my app to be able to handle that basic authentic uh, authorization. So. Um, Shout out again to to Ngrok for making it so easy to um, debug stuff locally from the outside and to capture everything that's going back and forth. And another bonus, it does the TLS handling for you too, right? So if you have uh, you know an application running on you know port eighty on your machine, Ngrok can be reached over HTTPS. Yeah, that's right. And and in this particular case, I have a, a paid account thanks to Okta. Um, and so I get to have a fixed subdomain, which is awesome. But even if you don't have a paid account, I think by default, it gives you a random subdomain and they have a wildcard cert. So it'll still be protected by uh, SSL. And I think even on the free tier, I think you get something like four or six hours of having this endpoint up and addressable. And then after that, you just have to restart Ngrok and you get a new subdomain. So it's pretty it's pretty generous in like how you can use it even even for free. Um, so Heather asked the question about stuff that Okta's done, and this has become like um, over the course of the last uh, year. This is something that we announced at Octane 19, so in uh, April of 2019, I guess. Um, so we're coming up on like a, a year and a half of it going from beta. Uh, to early access and now to full production. But um, we have these different categories of webhooks in Okta that um, some of which are async and some of which are sync, uh, synchronous. Um, the, the synchronous ones um, are things that you can do to, um, you know, to impact various types of workflows in your interaction with Okta. So I guess it's worth taking a, a quick step back and saying Okta is an identity management platform. And so anything that you're concerned with managing users, authenticating and authorizing users, you offload that to Okta so that you don't have to reinvent that wheel. And what I have up here is just some of our documentations. The first, the first one that I thought I'd show and then maybe we could talk about it a little bit is a very common kind of use case where very few of our customers, even even like uh, people who are doing hobby projects with Okta, very few of them come with like a totally greenfield situation. They have, you know, they've built something locally. Maybe they were using SQL Server on the back end or Postgres. Um, hopefully, they were, you know, storing their passwords in some uh, protected way. But now they want to migrate an existing user base to Okta. And the way that we used to have to do that is we would have to run, uh, we would have to rely on our customers to do all the heavy lifting to migrate those users um, if they wanted to run alongside their current auth system. So the typical scenario would be you have like a shim application that when you go to authenticate, 
gathers those credentials that you just put in, checks it against your legacy system. If you get the thumbs up, it then uses the Okta API to create that user and and uh, set their password. And we we were able to use um, we were able to use webhooks to kind of streamline that whole process. And it's a little this request here that's on my screen right now. It's a little arcane. But the important thing here is that in the credentials part of the JSON, rather than actually setting a password, we're telling it that we're going to set it up as a default import hook. And what that means is that we can create a user that's ready to be imported. And then all we need you to do is to write some code that checks against that legacy system and gives a thumbs up or a thumbs down but Okta will now automatically migrate that user. That is, if your service, your webhook gives the thumbs up, Okta will take that plain text password and store it on the back end safely and, and um, you know, protected with, with bcrypt hashes and all the stuff that we do on the back end without you having to um, worry about like provisioning and setting that user manually. So I can actually copy this as is because I cheated a little and set some of these variables in advance. So also so that I wouldn't have to show you my, uh, my API token. But all I'm gonna do- Oh, and you're no fun. Right? All I'm gonna do is create this user. So I'm creating a new user in Okta and typically let's say you have 10,000 users, you would iterate over your database and you would create the users um, in Okta using the data that you already have just without credentials. All right, and I forgot that I was using curl, but the important thing here is that the provider type has been set as, as import. So this is now a fully created active user, but this user can't yet um, uh, log in in a vacuum. Because if we go to this um, Okta org that I have, I created this, pass, this password import inline hook and you can see that Okta is going to reach out to my endpoint. This is how webhooks work. So Okta is going to make a request of my um, my endpoint, and um, and then it's up to me to say yes, that's the right password, or no, that's not the right password. And oh, how did you how did you yeah. get to that screen on the dashboard? Oh, good point. So if you go to workflow and inline hooks you can then start adding inline hooks and you can see the different ones that we have. In this case, I did a password import hook and you fill out some form information like the URL. Um, you can give it, Okta will send a basic authentication header uh, just for the purposes of demonstration. I left it blank, not a great idea in real life. Um, and so then Okta, Whenever, and this is a global setting, right? So now when any user goes to authenticate that is in that imported state, it's gonna use this hook. And this is kind of a subtle and important thing here. You might think that, oh man, my, you know, my, my uh, password import webhook is gonna get hammered by Okta. It's only for users that haven't already migrated. So once, the webhook gives the thumbs up and says that's a good password that user will transition from being provider type import to provider type okta and once it's provider type okta then my webhook no longer gets called for that particular user so if i have 10,000 users and 9900 of them are already migrated it's only ever going to call my webhook for that for those last 100 users that still have to migrate. So, so now, does this, does this just get set up and configured forever? Like, what happens if I got uh, my mother who doesn't want to log in but once a year to things? Like, how? Yeah. <laughs> how no, long does a, I have to set up? Yeah, that's a great question. Typically, first of all, you know, the the unsatisfying answer in our industry always is it depends. Um, but the, the answer is that typically our customers will run like a 60 day or a 90 day program. And at the end of which some high percentage, like let's say 90% of their active users have migrated by that point for those users that are still in this import state, 
you use the Okta API to say, give me all the users that are in this provider import, and I'm going to uh, initiate a password reset on each of those users. And so now they're going to get an email saying, hey, it's time to change your password. And some percentage of those users will go and change their password. You know, with these kind of migration programs, you don't you you typically don't catch every last user because some of them are inactive, but it's the way to get like the vast majority within that 60 or 90 days will migrate. And then some percentage of the remainder will migrate over time. Um, you know, when they get that that email that says, hey, it's time to change your password. Right. And the, the idea here too is that you're you're uh taking a load off your support staff by not resetting everybody's password, right? You're allowing them to log in from the user's perspective. It's, 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 you know, uh, it just works the way it did yesterday. Um, but you know, some subset of users, you know, whoever doesn't log in. Yeah, that's in, right. They yeah. Don't, they don't get that. And so I have an incognito window here. Now, if I log in as this other user that already has a password set in Okta, and remember the password, my, my uh, password hook never gets hit. That user is already an Okta user, not an import user. However, if I log in as that user that I just created that's in that, uh, that set to type import, right? Now I'm going to type in anything here. Okta doesn't know yet, but what Okta is going to do is it's going to hit my password hook. And now it just passed in this request. And I, for those of you that are, that are Java people, if you're not, please don't hold it against me. But for those of you that are Java people, it's really easy to convert a JSON object to a map of string object. And you can have it nested and, you know, be as deep as it needs to. It's kind of the, the poor man's way to uh, start with model objects. But I can take a look at this request that's coming in, and I can see that among the things, it's passing me all kinds of metadata, event IDs and stuff like that. And then within that, it's got this data, and that data has, hold on, I got to keep digging into the layers here. Hold on, I'm going to turn off the... Uh, so, so find while, the right place here. Why? While, while you're looking, at, uh, I do want to point out too that we do have a Java SDK around this, but this this sort of shows more of a JSON view. Uh, but so, if you are a Java right. developer, you could check out our SDK for that, which wraps it up in more of a, a DSL. Um, but yeah, that's for right. You don't demonstration have to... purposes. This is this is a, a good view. Well, and yeah, you don't have to go around. Not every not every SDK in every language has this implemented yet, so it's good for us to know at a high level. Right how we can just read the object. Yeah. Uh, it, I'm a .NET developer, so of course I'm like, oh yeah, I can just use an anonymous object type and then as it comes in, I can check against it. But I, I think we have documentation around the JSON structure of what we're gonna get, right? Yep. Yeah, that's exactly right. I can show that in just a sec. But what I was looking for is, you know, buried in this request object is the username and password that the user put in and Okta is looking for a response from my webhook to, to give it the thumbs up or the thumbs down. Now I have it set up here to return verified by default, but let's let's uh, let's change that to unverified. I'm gonna set the value here, and I may have to do it twice because I think the first request is the is like a uh, cores request or something. Yeah, let me set that twice. I'm going to set that to unverified. And then back over here, it just says unable to sign in. So my request, my webhook responded back to Okta uh, with the thumbs down, basically. And so our interface doesn't give you a lot of information about what, what, what went wrong. It just says unable to sign in, which is, you know, a good security practice. Now, if I try to do this again, this time I'll let it go through. And now it's transitioned to let it, uh, letting me finish creating this account in Okta. And now I'm fully authenticated as this user Isaac. And I don't, you know what's funny? I might not remember what password I put in there, but this time 
it shouldn't hit my webhook at all because now that user is um, is fully tra uh, transitioned over. Let's see. Oh, dang it. But what I can do is just show you this really quick. If we hit the, I'm going to do a little bit of uh, live coding here. What could go wrong? API v1 users. And I'll give it, and I know you can't see that, maybe you can't see that on the bottom of my screen, but it'll all become clear in just a second. And just need to look back and see what API token. All right, API token. All right, so I'm just gonna hit the user's endpoint. This is the Okta API. And if I look at that, Isaac Brock user, I can see that um, the provider type now is Okta, not import, because that user has been fully migrated thanks to the magic of webhooks. And that um, matching, that I identity that we have here is based on their email address, is that correct? Yeah, that's right. In this particular case, the glue, if you will, is, is their email address. Um, it doesn't necessarily have to be. We have we have uh, customers that use other types of identifiers, um, you know, just uh, like shipping companies that just use uh, user IDs that are long numbers or something like that. Uh, but for the purposes of demonstration, it's easy just to make it an, an email address. Yeah. So so whenever you import your users, you can associate whatever metadata you have at the time and. You know, if you have some internal ID, you could look up on that ID versus an email address. Yeah, and the the uh, the documentation that we have on this is is pretty extensive. Where you can um, you can do things like uh, in that response that the webhook sends back, you can do things like set um, custom profile attributes. You know, as part of that uh, migration, so it's pretty rich. And you know, there are a lot of there are a lot of companies. Um, that do this sort of thing, that have a, a method for how you're gonna migrate your users, but they often involve a lot more heavy lifting on the customer's part. And that's the way it used to be for us. It used to be that rather than us just respond, rather than having our customers uh, write a small piece of code that returns verified or unverified, our customers had to really get deep into the weeds of the Okta API and go and uh, you know create a user and set the password and activate the user, kind of manage that whole life cycle on their own. Now we have import as kind of a first class citizen in the life cycle of uh, an Okta identity. So that was pretty so cool. It's, that is really cool. So is that what Okta hooks means? It's an importation hook or are there different kinds of hooks? There are different kinds of hooks. So that was an example of an inline hook. Um, and we have a couple of different other types of inline hooks. We have uh, registration hooks and we have token hooks. Um, the registration hook is just some additional uh, validation verification that you might wanna do at registration time. And the typical example um, that, that I've seen is um, you, you've written this app and um, when an Okta, you know, maybe you have like a, a, a cloud of applications and you have this new applications and before you allow a, a user to register for this new application, you just want to validate some piece of information about them. Maybe they need to have a password or rather a credit card on file, or maybe you want to do some external check that says they've even, maybe this is a beta app and you only want uh, users that have been invited. It's publicly available. Anybody could go to the front door but you only want users that have been invited to go and be able to register for this beta app. So you can use this registration hook. And again, it's kind of like a, a thumbs up, thumbs down thing. The Okta will call your web hook. And if the response says, you know, uh, essentially expresses uh, allow that user to register, then Okta will allow that user to register. And if not, then they, they won't be able to register, even though it's, you know, sitting there on the public web so in, in the past we kind of had two modes of operation it was either private and some 
you know, you had to call up some help desk and say, you know, give them your employee number and have them provision you for this application. And then you could log in and set your password the first time. Or it was completely open. Anybody could register. And this is kind of an in-between state where you can control who's allowed to register and, and who's not. Um, the other type of hook, which is, which I think, you know, I have a bias, uh, when it comes to like OAuth is, uh, the token hook. And that really adds a lot of, a lot of power. Um, and that allows you to alter the contents of a JWT type token in flight, which is kind of a, a cool feat of engineering. Um, but more importantly, uh, usefulness for Okta customers. So the idea, you know, with JWTs, if you're not familiar, part of the power of JWTs is that they're signed with a private key and you grab the public key and validate that signature, which gives you a high degree of confidence that you can trust what's in the payload. That's kind of baseline JWT. So that's the benefit of it. Um, and in the past, it's been really hard to have any sort of dynamic interaction or dynamic uh um, changes to that payload because it requires uh, to re-sign. If you, if you change the payload and you don't re-sign the JWT, it's instantly invalid because the signature isn't going to match properly. So what this, and, and part of the, especially with Okta, part of the challenge is that we don't ever expose the private key used to sign JWTs to anybody, not even internal employees. So it's not like you could say, well, I'll let Okta sign my JWTs, but when I want to, I'll use that private key to do my own thing. You don't have that option. So what the inline token hooks allows you to do is, just like we saw before, Okta will reach out to your service, and through JSON, you can express changes or additions that you want to be included in that JWT. And then Okta will add that those claims, that's key value pairs and JWTs are called claims. Okta will update the payload and it will re-sign and it does all that in flight. So you, it really opens the door to a lot of dynamic behavior. And, and part, of the, part of the whole motivation for webhooks in general is to be able to kind of be future facing and roll with uh, behaviors that might be requirements for your app that the service provider never accounted for. You know, so if you have some interesting app that needs to add all kinds of claims on the fly, there's no way that Okta can anticipate that. So we give you this mechanism now through these inline token hooks to be able to do that. So you provide additional claims or maybe an alteration of existing claims. Okta updates the JWT, including re-signing it, and then your application receives a JWT that's ready to be validated because the signature is correct. So super, super powerful. And I really think we're kind of just scratching the surface um, on the types of use cases and, and the power that you can, you know, squeeze out of that that type of, uh, of hook. And so we've kind of, we've kind of given our customers all these tools um, and now we're seeing some some interesting emerging uh, use cases. For a long time, we've had lots of requests of, you know, for this user, I want to have this set of claims. For this other user, I want a different set of claims. And it's we, we've we've kind of twisted ourselves in pretzels in the past to try to make that happen. Now with this inline token hook, you can just you can just do it. The the one downside I will say is, or the one challenge is that because this is a synchronous operation. It has to happen in flight. Um, your webhook has three seconds to finish its job. And if it doesn't complete successfully, you're just going to get the original token without any changes. Mm. So that's something your app has to be prepared to deal with. You can't assume, your app can't assume that um, claims are, are going to be there uh, because maybe that token hook call uh, failed for whatever reason. So it just has to be able to deal with failures in, a, in an expanded kind of way. Um, but it's an interesting challenge. You have to write 
uh, a program that's that's uh, resilient enough to respond in three seconds, which in the in the context of the internet is actually pretty generous. I mean, really, if it's taking that long, there's something wrong anyway. You want it to be like, you know, sub 100 millisecond, ideally. I mean, I do agree with you, but in my world of legacy applications, that's not always the case. So it's yes. good to know. It's the same way, actually. So this is not just an octa of idiosyncrasy. If the same thing happens when I had worked uh, with Amazon's Alexa service, is that pretty much if your uh, hook did not respond within, I believe it's like three to four seconds, it says, I'm sorry, I can't actually reach this particular skill right now. And that's that was the default of what would happen for the user. So it made it forced a lot of the companies that I worked with to um, make sure they refined uh, their data down to like maybe a stored procedure so they can get things really quickly and uh, make sure they have a, a good trim microservice for this. This is an excellent example of what a microservice should be for and not your ginormous REST API, right? Yeah, and to right. be fair, I mean, you know, for, for user experience, right? If you're logging in, you don't want to wait I mean, three seconds is a long, long time, right? You, you know, so so you have the the call to Okta. Okta has to deal with your your password or whatever, right? There's some some crypt, cryptographic uh, delay that has to happen, and then we call out like so. You are adding delay, but you know, like Mike said, if you can respond, you know, within 100 milliseconds, a quarter second, then your user's not gonna not gonna really realize it, and especially that's only once. So that's when you log in, and that token is valid for your you know some duration in you know, your service isn't connected, isn't contacted again. So maybe you can show me that list, Micah, of how, if I'm starting from the beginning, because there's all these options that are already swimming, I'm sure, in the heads of our viewers. <laughs> okay, you are talking about inline hooks, but there's also something on our site called event hooks. How do we think about each of them? Like, what does it mean to be an inline hook? And what does it mean to be in an event hook? Because that's what, if they search for hooks on our documentation, that's what they're going to see. So how do I remember what means what? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, with the the so event hooks are asynchronous and they're passive. What what I mean by that is any anytime you do anything, uh, uh, mainly write operations within Okta, you change a password, you authenticate, uh, a token is issued. All of those types of events are recorded in the system log. The, the event hook uh, makes it so that you can capture all those events in a, in a very similar way that Okta's built-in system log already does. So event hooks are, are asynchronous and they're all about events that have, that have happened in the Okta org. So, um, you know, there's no like uh, on the fly alteration of event hooks or anything like that. They're really informational. It's also a great way, like we integrate with um, you know, Splunk and Datadog and Sumo Logic for uh, long-term capture and analysis of logs. Uh, that's great. But this is a situation where if you're doing some casual sort of uh, data gathering, you can set up event hooks and, and have an endpoint that Okta will call and just capture all of those events um, on your own. And Okta is not gonna Okta is not gonna wait for you to respond. I mean, it does expect a response, but you know, all Okta does is call your endpoint, send event JSON information, and kind of you know, Okta's done. It's up to you to capture that and do something with it. It's not that that kind of critical time window like inline hooks, um, password hooks, registration hooks, and token hooks are all synchronous because they're dependent in some way. They're dependent on your response. And they will time out and, you know, the kind of dynamic you were talking about with, with Alexa. It's not going to wait forever for user experience sake, um, but they, they are dependent on your service responding in a certain way. And uh, things kind of get interesting in that realm because, um, for instance, you were talking about with Alexa, like it'll, it'll error out if, if it takes too long. Um, with, with inline token hooks, for instance, Okta made kind of an engineering and, and just a general decision to say, if your inline token hook times out, rather than generate an error condition and trip up your application, Okta is just gonna return the default token that it was gonna return anyway. So you've already authenticated, it's not like a security risk, 
It's just that you were intending to return some sort of enhanced token. Your service timed out. So Okta says, well, I'm just going to return the original token that I was going to return anyway. And that's where, you know, your your application might have to be a little smart in um, in dealing with that. But, you know, you have to make those calls when it's a synchronous hook uh, because there has to be some sort of uh, reasonable timeout associated with it for user experience. You know, Heroku, uh, by contrast, just because of the way their add-ons work, they give you a generous 12 hours to tell Heroku that your provisioning is done. And, you know, I can't imagine a service that would ever really take that long, but, you know, provisioning an Okta org using the Okta Heroku add-on does take about 40 seconds. And Heroku accommodates that, and some provisioning takes longer, some provisioning is quicker, um, but you get that kind of visual feedback of those of those three dots that says, hey, we're still provisioning this, this add-on. Um, the, uh, the link that you put up is, is a good one to, to get some, you know, concepts under your belt, um, for, uh, for those, uh, uh, different types of hooks. And one thing that I wanted to show people, uh, bear with me a second and I will share my screen one more time. We have kind of this ongoing, um, developer challenge. We used to just set this up for um, for conferences. And we kind of debuted this, this web app at Octane 19. And now uh, we've run the app with different subdomains in, I want to say, a dozen or more conferences. But uh, this is experience.octachallenge.dev. So we just kind of made it generally accessible now. And this first tier just walks you through some uh, kind of general entry-level type of interaction with Okta's API. You create a user, you create a group, you create some apps. But tier two is, is where it gets interesting, especially with uh, today's topic, because it's all about the different types of hooks. And we actually exercise every hook except for the password import hook. So you have event hooks, registration hooks, and this uh, authorization section is all about those token inline hooks. So this is publicly available. You just uh, come over here and give us some minimal information. And we, this is uh, uh, all we ask is your name and an email address. And then you go create an Okta org. And then it actually gives you a customized Postman collection that you can use to follow along each of these uh, use cases and scenarios. It shows you- That's so helpful, oh my goodness. Yeah, so um, th these two tiers are not dependent on each other too. So if all you care about is the hook stuff, you don't even have to do the first one. Um, but if you wanna get familiar with the Okta API in general, this is a good place to start. It shows you your, your progress as you, uh, you know, play the game, so to speak. Um, you know, you download this Postman collection, and then you you can open that in Postman, and it's all set. It's preset with your Okta org and your API token and everything that you need to then uh, work through each of these little challenges. Um, so that's a really good place to go to to you know uh, kind of dig into uh, more of the meat of these of these different types of hooks that we have. Okay, so for this one, are you using an event hook or an inline hook for the developer challenge? Well, uh, both actually. Uh, so you start out on the second tier, you start out creating an event hook and you can actually see incoming events uh, through this little uh, JavaScript app that we host on uh, Glitch. So if you follow through this uh, example and get everything set up, you'll actually see an interface where um, you can start to see events coming in, uh, getting captured because of uh, the event hook uh, setup. And then from there you go, the, the last two here, so there's event hooks, which is our asynchronous hooks uh, and our, our passive hook. And then um, the registration hook and the uh, inline token hook 
walks you through our synchronous hooks and shows you how you can, you know, transform a um, an access token by adding additional information to it. Okay, so the way that we think about this, correct me if I'm wrong, Brian, is that inline hooks are, think about it, that when the user is registering or logging in, and basically once they hit the server and Okta is in the process of creating or generating a token for them, it is in flight. So while it's in line to go back to the user, you can stop the process in that flow and either um, do you know check things on the background and you can say yes you can continue or no you can't or hey by the way I want to add some extra baggage onto your your claims there and then it goes but event hooks are observational right you don't stop the flow at all they're just like a FYI this user just did a thing in case you want to fire an email in the background is that correct I just want to make sure that I'm interpreting correctly <laughs> Yep, you got it. So the, the event hooks are more of a fire and forget, you know, and, and the inline hooks are definitely uh, you can stop the world type of type of event. You have well, the power. <laughs> uh, you have the power. Yeah, so um, I, I, uh, I wasn't sure if we'd have time to like actually look at some of this, but let's see, just for fun, why don't you and Brian talk for a moment, and I will see if I can't get the event hooks set up in the in the app here, and we can actually see it in uh, in action here. All right, so we got a bunch of events that you can kind of you know observe, right, Brian? I I haven't I don't have it up in front of me. Maybe you can grab uh, what some of those are. Uh, what, what, what do you think is the coolest one that you've been able to actually play with in a demo uh, that you think would be useful? Because there's all sorts of different levels depending on who our users are, users meaning who our, like our, our customers are. Yeah, so I think my favorite is the inline token hooks. So there's just a lot of power. I mean, I know we touched on this earlier. Um, in the password hooks, it's great too, but the token inline hook I think is going to be the most used. So it allows me to isolate you know, some sort of custom logic and inject it into the user's flow. So, you know, if I have some some spa application uh, that needs access to some private data, I don't want my spa reaching out to some data source, right? I don't need to deal with any of that. Um, Okta can securely reach out to my service. My service will respond to Okta, say, yeah, add my favorite color is blue. And then now my, my spa application knows my favorite color is blue without having to do an additional lookup or, you know, try to deal with, with uh, you know, a separate request or figuring out how to authenticate, you know, my spy application to talk securely to my, my API. I don't need to do any of that. It's, it's already there. Okay, so that means that it's just part of the token. So when it deserializes, you have that additional pieces of information instead of, hold on, let me, now that I have the token or the access token, now I have the ability to call Okta's users API to get information about them back. You don't have to because it just came in flight with it. Absolutely. And it's even better if you have, you know, if I have a hundred different applications that all need, you know, some sort of subset of data, uh, I just can have one microservice to add that data to my token. And then all of my applications could potentially have access to it. Nice. So that means it could actually be stuff that isn't even stored in Okta. It could be stored in your own database that you add. That's Ab pretty cool. Absolutely. So it's my secret sauce, right? That that Okta doesn't doesn't persist. Uh, it sticks it in the token. Obviously, to Okta knows that token for for some period of time, um, but we do not persist it. Okta doesn't store it. Um, so it's it's still your your data, your IP, whatever. If if those are your concerns. I think for me, uh, when I was looking at event hooks, I'm really interested in uh, like DDoS attacks. I'm interested in, in different kinds of ways that hackers would try and spam like perhaps my registration or whatever. And I think observing um, certain amounts of behavior is probably really useful. So instead of it being in a black box that Octa just has, and you can just trust logs, you actually get to see the logs as they happen and you can perhaps send it off to another service to um, also kind of take a look at and monitor. Yeah, absolutely. So so with the, the event hooks, you know, again, fire and forget your ac application, just queuing them, or maybe you're forwarding them to some, some you know, data analytics package or whatever, or, or maybe you're just queuing them up. So, 
you know, your support team can figure out what's going on with with uh, with the developers log. I mean, sorry, a user's login. Now, obviously, some of those things you can do in the Octa dashboard, right? But if you want to do something, some advanced analysis on that data, you could do it in real time as opposed to you know, sort of doing some some after the fact batch batch processing. So let's say I'm part of a big company, uh, like let's say an electric car manufacturing company and we have different divisions. And so me as a developer, perhaps I'm only working on stuff that would be inside the car. And that means that I may not have access to the entire Okta org of users. Can you do hooks at an application level or is it at more like at like a group permissions level or is it really across the whole org? How does it work? That's a great question. So, so the hooks are set up at an authorization server level, hmm. um, but you have you have enough context that your hook can make a decision um, based on that information, right? So, so if I'm logging in and I'm calling a token inline hook, um, my my handling application, right? Whoever's handling that webhook knows what scopes I have, potentially what groups I have, my my email address, wh whatever identifying information and then I can, you know, uh, I can give them a different subset of data than I would, you know, maybe an admin or, or somebody. Mm. So you okay. definitely have the power. So if I created my own, let's say I only have control over the app that's in the car, right? But I don't have control over maybe their user's profile like somewhere else. That means I could create my own authorization server and that way I would be able to do it at the auth server level. Yep. Um, that's pretty cool. Uh, so that means that you aren't married to the process for the entire company or the entire user base. You can do it per situation. Absolutely. Right. For me, I've noticed that there's a difference between a grandfathered in or perhaps a, a setup user account outside of my application and an application initiated registration. That seems to be like a completely different flow. Like the, perhaps the user, once we brand it, may not even know that they are an Octa user. They'll just be like, hey, it's my cool car company's account um, at that point, right? So it, I've always been interested in how, how much of this is set up to where your user with many applications on like our Octa dashboard versus you don't know about the dashboard. You just know about the app in the car and you just wanna make sure you can log into it and change your stuff from there. Yeah, so so I think that's the ideal. Like, uh, you know, even as an Okta employee, right? I, I think the ideal experience is is your users don't don't know what authorization server you're using, right? So it just just works. Everything's themed. Everything looks great, um, and it's all transparent to the user. You know, on the back end, the developer side, you know, obviously we want to expose all of these things and, and make things powerful. But from the user experience, they shouldn't have to deal with with any of that. Right. Um, I guess this is more we're thinking about um, customer identity access management or people who are not within an organization. Um, so they may not even know that they're doing an import. For example, like we have, uh, you know, customers that are some of the largest social networks in the world. Right. But you may not know that Okta is the one who's handling some of that in the background or you know, it, it's, they don't want to see that that's what it is. That's different, of course, than, hey, you work at um, a carpet cleaning company and you know that you use Okta because you have a dashboard with different apps that is a single sign on into all those apps. Uh, so there's like a difference between whether or not your end users know because they are part of your company or if they are external customers is a completely different experience. Right, so, so the cool thing is that all the inline hooks work the same way for both of those cases. So from the developer's experience, um, you know, it's it's not different. Obviously, from you know how you architect and how you set things up, right? There's there's some, some concerns there, but um, but you know from from how how the all the the pieces fit and work together, it's all the same. Awesome, Mike, are you ready to show so, uh, things? Yeah. So while you guys were having that interesting conversation, I was sweating to see if this would uh, work. You always run into the demo monster, but I got it to the point now where we're ready to actually create. Uh, the event hook in Okta. And I'll just show you this API call that it's about to make. And when you set up event hooks, you tell it the life cycle or, or the events that you're interested in capturing. And there may be more than this at this point, but we listed a whole bunch of them. So anytime, what we're expressing here is that anytime any of these events fire within Okta, 
it's going to reach out to our application and send that event hook along for us to capture and maybe do something with. So I'm going to call the Okta API to set up this event hook. And let's see, uh, I got a 200 response, so that's good. I didn't break anything. Um, and now it gives us this event hook ID. And so following uh, back here, the, the, the next thing that we need to do is to verify that event hook ID. And so um, in my set of environment variables here that come along with this collection, I can set that hook ID. And now when I go to verify it, if we look up here, it's actually using, if you're not familiar with Postman, one of the great things about it is that it can, you can plug in these environment variables and if they're there, it will use them. And so now we can verify this event hook ID and now its status is active. So now any event that happens, Okta is gonna fire off a request to our endpoint and show us information uh, or, or it'll just send the raw event data and then we do with it whatever we want. And so now if I take this uh, glitch app that I set up, so now this app is waiting for events and so far it hasn't gotten any, but let's see if I go over to, um, this kind of demo app that we use. I had already authenticated here, but let me go ahead and log out and let me um, let me log in once again. And we should now be capturing some events. So I'm gonna log in incorrectly and then I'll log in correctly and it sends us back to this app. In the meantime, if we jump back over to here, we can see now this is kind of the raw data that Okta is sending over to our event hook. Um, so you can see here the latest event was session start. Um, somewhere in the list here, it should have uh, the error that I put in there. Let's see. Let's see if I can find it. It gives you all kinds of meta information, the geolocation of the request. So you get a ton, yeah, here we go, failure, invalid credentials. So you get a ton of information from Okta and other services, like I mentioned earlier, Sumo Logic and others are, you know, you can configure to ingest all this data, but if you wanna capture this data for whatever reason, um, you have the ability to. Wow, look at this, Verizon is my provider and it still shows up as MCI communications. That's like right out of the 90s. Anyway, this is what this application, this is how this application renders the JSON that it got from Okta. So all Okta is doing is sending over this JSON data and like its job is done. And then we have this application that's now rendering um, that data for us for us to look at here. And for, for people that are interested, I did all of this. I mean, you guys were talking for maybe five or seven or eight minutes. I got all the way over to this point, you know, just navigating my way through this, through this application and working with Postman to get everything set up. So it is kind of a handy tool to, uh, to learn about um, the, uh, the Okta API. And I wonder, are we giving, oh yeah, look at this. We're giving, so if you go to experience.octachallenge.dev, we're actually, uh, through our marketing department, we're giving away like T-shirts and water bottles and stickers and stuff. So you actually can can get a prize if you go and uh, play the developer challenge. I know, and we're going to have all sorts of fun, um, like hackathon style things happening soon. I'm really excited to see what the community does with some of these hooks. I think it's going to be very, um, I want to see like how much automation can you put in, in this flow to where you don't even have to think about it. Um, maybe you can use Terraform or Pulumi or something like that for some of this as well. I think it'd be super cool to see how people set up some of their monitoring dashboards of like, this is how much we're seeing. So you don't you don't even have to log into Okta at all because you can pull the data into maybe your own database and you can put your own kind of visualizations up. I think there's a lot here that will make you feel really 
empowered when it comes to that. Um, I know that we have about like five or 10 more minutes. So what do you think um, is something that you would like to see people mess around with when it comes to hooks that you haven't seen yet? Well, I'll tell you one thing that I'm working on right now that I want to encourage everybody to do, and that is I'm writing a little Twilio integration where every time there's a um, an invalid login, like I showed, every time that event fires, it's going to send a text message to Brian to let him know that somebody didn't provide the correct credentials. And anybody that wants to take this on, I will gladly provide you with Brian's phone number so that you can have it send him messages also. Just, you know, want to put that out there. But seriously, though, I am working on that as a little service. Like every time somebody has an invalid authentication, it can fire off a text message saying, hey, somebody just tried to log into your app and they didn't, they didn't, they failed. Like maybe this is something you want to look at. That's pretty yeah, cool. I think if, if anyone has a really cool, unique idea that, that you've done, I think you should let us know. Um, send us an email at, uh, what is it, Okta? What, what's what's our developer? You actually put put it put it down yeah, here. Devrel Devrel at Okta.com. There you go. Thank you. And then and then we'll we'll find that we'll find a really cool one and we'll send you a t-shirt or uh, if you have a really great implementation. And yeah, you know, I like, like, like I said, to yeah, I like to mash up different APIs, make things uh, work together that were never intended to do so. So I have uh, fun with just that. Tweet tweet at Micah, you know, you know, every time you log in, just Send send them. Uh, yeah, that's right. Send me a private <laughs> message at a fit nerd every time you log in. You can right. do that with event hooks. Yeah. Oh, pl uh, please don't do that for me. Uh, I already have to mitigate a lot of that stuff. <laughs> oh my goodness! Well, thank you, Micah, for showing us this. I think that. Um, I had no idea when I joined that Okta even did this. I was curious if this was something that like all external auth providers have is this something that we can do and i think each one is a little bit unique as to what they offer uh, but here it seemed like i just felt like i had way more control as a dev to the whole flow process i suppose uh, specifically around like checking and some of the events i think were super cool like i i know i was part of a, a like a words heather marketing company for a long time and so knowing that a user had difficulty with their password or that they had issues logging in i could actually personalize an email to them or we could send that because we have their information on file we could send them um like a reminder sms about how to do things or whatever we wanted to do in that case you could use twilio for that right um i Indeed. found I found it to be like a, just a world of possibilities that way that I just didn't see very often. So that's very cool. Thank you so much for showing us that and for Brian for also chiming in on how everything works um, because uh, people who are watching may not know this, but both of you have worked in our engineering department before at Okta, before you moved over to advocacy, right? Yeah, I definitely spent uh, I don't know three three years or so on the the Okta engineering team. Right. So if you have any really strong questions about why things are the way they are, these two guys, which I, where direction are you? The other two people <laughs> on the on the Twitch stream are the ones you want to reach out to. Um, so I'm going to uh, put up. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and put my t my Twitter handle in our chat if you're interested in like talking to me. I'm uh, at Coraline, and you can definitely put yours in as well in case people want to continue the conversation over there. Got it. Got it. Awesome. So, thank you for happy hacking. Yes. Yes. Happy hacking. <laughs> 